tell you, uh, the Jubilee has been trying to get Paul to sing with us for a while now. <laughs> he said about a hundred women sing the Jubilee. <laughs> Boy, that ain't going too good. But <laughs> what a blessing to be with you. I'll tell you what, what an exciting day it is. Amen? Amen. It does feel like I'm coming home too. I, I consider Sylvania, this area, to be my home. I've been here, I've lived here almost nine years of my life. So it was just a joy to be able to come back and, and be here. And to, thank you, Brother Paul. I love you too. I'm just like my brother. And, uh, God, God brought me in here. No doubt about it. I'm just glad that that God gave me the maybe the insight to help point Paul this way. But well, I'm so glad. I know that you're glad to have him as your pastor too. Amen. 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 All the glory goes to God. Amen. Well, it's just again joy to be with you. My daughter's here. I mean, my wife's here. <laughs> and uh, uh, we have two children. One lives in Macon. The other one's still at home. Is a junior in high school. And uh, he's had, he's working good Chick Fil A, so uh, they won't have Chick Fil A here in Egypt one of these days. I'm really, uh, so we're working on it. Uh, this is the delight to be here. Gotta get the chicken. Okay. Brian, good to see you. Never thought that Brian and I would end up on the same side of the state. <laughs> well, we live about maybe 35 minutes from each other, so uh, it's a joy to be able to be with Brian. I've been over with him uh, last year. Um, this church, so what a joy! Well, I tell you what, Nancy and uh, Shannon, what a blessing you are for me! Wow, uh, I've been excited enough since we've come to sing the same with these girls. I'll tell you right now, uh, what a blessing! You guys, I'll tell you what, good to see you again, Steve. What a blessing to see y'all and have y'all here, and, and uh, praise God for your ministry. Amen. We've been singing a lot about homecoming. Been singing about our future. Right. I'm going to tell you, friend, if you're a child of God, our future is in heaven. Amen. And I'm looking forward to that great homecoming. Right. You know, I'm looking forward to that day when we can do nothing but just sing around the throne of God. Amen. Won't have to be no more preacher, brother Paul. We'll be out of business. Amen. But we'll be singing. That's right. We'll be praising. We'll be glorifying God. And I'm looking forward to that day. And I don't know, you know, when it's going to happen. You know, we can. <coughs> We could all just take, be taken out right now. I'm looking forward to that. It could happen. I hope that you're ready. I hope that you're a child of God this morning. And I could come this morning. I've been praying about what God would lay in my heart to share with you. And I thought, well, I could preach about the homecoming that we'll have together and talk about the rapture. But I think all of us know that day, that day's come. We know what's like. We can read Revelation. We, we can see what it's all going to be about. And there's a lot of scripture that points us towards the rapture and, and, then, and then the second coming. And, but I think what I really feel like the Lord's leading me to do today is to encourage you and the Baptist Church and those who are here today, maybe other churches, to encourage us as Christians because friends, there's still a lot of work to be done yes. until we have the great homecoming. That's right. There are approximately 75% of people in our communities that are lost and are dying. You can tell. You can, you can, I can drive down the road right now. We can see that there's people that are not in church. <clears throat> I probably would estimate that most of those people do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Because I believe if you love Christ, you will love the things of Christ. And you want to be around God's people. But I want to come and share with you and hopefully encourage you this morning, especially this church body, to let you know that we are called to be salt and light in a dark world. And I can tell you, you can pick up a newspaper, watch the television, even just see the things that's happening in our communities. And I'll tell you what, friends, our world is growing more dark by the moment. And I'm afraid that we as the body of Christ are not being called, or we're not fulfilling the calling that God has called us to. And the text that we're going to read about shares about that in Matthew chapter 5. If you have your Bibles, if you'll turn with me. Matthew chapter 5, and we'll be looking at verses 13 through 16. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 through 16, and if you're able, capable of doing so, would you stand on the reverence of reading God's Word this morning? For 
where Jesus is speaking there on the Sermon on the Mount, and he's just, he, uh, just finished the Beatitudes, and he continues on talking about what we're, how we're supposed to live. And he says in verse 13, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. <coughs> and Father, just as you spoke these words to the disciples, those you were teaching in that day. Lord, I pray that it will be real to us because those words still apply to us today. Father, we are looking forward to that day when we gather together as the body of Christ to worship you around the throne. But yet we know that there are a lot of people living in our world and our communities who are lost and they're dying. Father, you called us to be salt and light and to help them to come to that realization that, that they are in need of a Savior. And Father, that you have, have chosen to use us to go and share the wonderful good news of Jesus Christ. So I pray, God, that you would encourage us today. God, that you would speak to our hearts. And Father, may we leave this building knowing very well and very clear what we're to do as your children. I thank you for you and your Baptist Church for the 144 years of its existence. And Father, we don't know when you're coming back, but Father, we pray that you would help us and help this church to continue to be a light in this community for years to come. So God, I pray now you would just speak and have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There was a family vacationing over in up north. <laughs> visiting grandparents. The grandmother decided to take grandkids out, show them around the town. So they were driving around and she pointed out different things and she said, well, hey, look, there's, there's our church. So she's pointing to a small little church and that's our church. That's the first Baptist church. The eight-year-old boy, little boy, the grandson replied, well, it must be a franchise because we have one of those too. And friends, I tell you that we're because we know there are a lot of churches <laughs> all around, especially in South Georgia. And I will tell you, I lived in a, this part of the world for about eight, nine years. I lived on in West Georgia for four years. And I'm going to tell you what, there are churches everywhere. In fact, there are nearly 42,000 Southern Baptist churches in the United States. And they say that 30,000 of them are plateaued and declining. The statistics show that there are about 15 million Southern Baptists in America. Yet the statistics reveal that only 14 million ever shared their faith with anybody. So I'm asking a question this morning. Does anybody, do we really need another church? Do we really need another house of worship with no outlet for evangelism? Friends, I'm going to tell you, I think you'll agree with me today that America has enough feel-good theology. We have enough social Christianity. Friends, we, we have enough, more than enough, health and wealth preachers in our country today. And I believe, Brother Paul, what America needs more than anything else is a group of people who would be willing to take the road less traveled. America needs a group of people who would be willing to be real with their faith. To take their faith from the sanctuary out into the church, out to the streets. We need a group of people who are willing to be the church of the living God. And we need a group of people who would be bold enough to stand firm on the words which we just read from Matthew chapter 5. It's very clear, church, that He called us to be salt of the, be salt of the world and to be light. But I, I believe in all my heart that I think as a church at large and as, as a whole, we're not doing a very good job. 
of being salt and light. And friends, we need to understand more than anything hearing this morning that there is more to worshiping God than just in a Sunday morning service. We need to understand, friends, that, that we need to realize that we're not the church until we're, we're carrying out the message of the cross to a lost and dying world. And I think the question we all need to ask this morning is, does anybody care? Does anybody care? I can tell you, I didn't know the ones who started this church. Brother Paul and I were back 144 years ago. <laughs> First cousin. First cousin. But I believe when the group of people that began the Elimedia Baptist Church began this church, I believe they knew what this verse was talking about. They knew that they needed to be a church. <coughs> they needed to be salt and light in this community. And I believe from that point on until today, now, there's a rich heritage, I'm sure, of any major Baptist church. I read it. I was association missionary for almost three years. So I know about any major Baptist church. And I can tell you that there are people who care. And I know that you care. But I want to encourage you this morning to understand that we have to get to a point in our life as individuals and as churches that we have to really care about lost people. You know, does anybody really care this morning that there are thirsty people at the water hole of this world drinking from a well that will never satisfy? Do we really care that there are people wasting away on the pleasures of this flesh that will never bring true fulfillment? And does anybody care that by the time we have finished our service here this morning and our great time of fellowship in the back and eating that probably fried chicken, I imagine, or turkey and dressing, Okay. But there are going to be literally over hundreds of people that have died by the time we finish our time together. And they, many of them will have died and, and they're spending eternity in hell. I'll tell you this morning that God cares. God cares so much that He sent His Son Jesus Christ to die on the Lord of the cross for you and for me. He cared enough to, to warn us of the dangers of a life without Him. And I believe that God cares and, and He did something about it. And friends, if we care, then we ought to do something about it and realize that God has called us to a huge task, a great task, but, but I, really, I believe it's pretty simple. When you have the love of Jesus and you have Jesus in your life, you have the Holy Spirit that dwells in you, we are able to carry the light into a dark world. But unfortunately, in many churches today, I've been an association missionary now for about, between the two associations, about seven years. And I can tell you that there are a lot of churches, not just in our associations, but throughout this land today, who are sitting around and they're talking about how are we going to reach the lost. And they strategize and they talk about it, but they never do anything about it. Several years ago, at the Georgia Baptist Convention Call, I don't know if you're you were there. It might have been. Dan Spencer was our president back then. And he was preaching a message about how we as churches in our convention, we sit around talking about trying to reach the lost and what we're going to do about trying to reach them, but we never do it. And then he used this analogy. I don't remember this, Brother Paul, but he said this. He said, imagine for a moment, you know, that uh, there are several farmers on 5,000 acres of the most fertile land in Georgia. He says they're, they're the most well-equipped, most trained, most educated farmers in the world. They all hold a master's degree in agriculture. And then he says that on the edge of their vast and fertile field, they erect a large state-of-the-art farm, and they fill it with top-of-the-line equipment. They buy these big old tractors these, with these really high-tech stereo systems and, and GPS devices and air conditioning. Then they get a bunch of the finest seed available and they put it in their barns and then once they do that, they, they get in their barn and they sit around and they talk about, you know, farming. They head over their charts and their diagrams and they talk about, you know, what the soil is like. They analyze it. And they talk about the weather patterns and they, they talk about maintaining their equipment and they hold seminars on how to be better farmers and, and they get to know each other quite well. And then meanwhile, it says the, the window of opportunity to get the seed in the ground comes and goes. And he says, nothing's done. He says, why? Because 
they become more fond of the barn and of each other than working in the fields. Once in a while, someone would come and say, well, let's quit talking about it and let's just get, get in the field and start planting. And they huddle in the corner and they say, hey guys, that's, that guy's just too evangelistic. Let's just get somebody to come in here and, and teach us the deeper truths of the precious seed. And once in a while, someone would come and actually go out in the field He'd bring back pictures. And they'd show, he'd show the pictures to everybody and they'd get all warm and fuzzy inside. And he said, well, next time this guy decides to go back out in the field, let's take up a love offering so we can find some more seed. And before long, summer is over and the winter's come and they begin to make excuses for not making a crop. And they would say, well, if only we'd have more attractive barns. And planting seed is so old-fashioned but at least our barn is bigger than the one down the road. And in the springtime, one of the young farmers would get that eager seed planting look in his eye and they say, oh, give him some time. He'll settle down just like the rest of us. And he says, and I agree with Brother Spencer that day, we have to do more than just talk about it. We have to take the seed with the love of Christ and work the field of faith. Because, friends, the fields are wide and harvest. And so this morning, real briefly, I know, you know like I am, I'm looking forward to the great meal we're going to have in just a moment. But I believe God wants to say something to us today. And for just a moment, I want to point out to you some things and what we ought to do about the crisis of faith in our society. The first thing I want to share with you and remind us of this morning is that we are simply to go. You see, we're no longer living in the era of come and see. You know, I, I grew up in a society, and imagine most of you had too, that the church was pretty much the, the, the central focal point of the community. People would come to the church because everything centered around it. But today I want to tell you, we're living in an era that really we have to go and tell. People aren't just coming anymore. We have to do what Jesus said. He went and he went among the people to seek and save those which were lost. And I'm going to tell you this morning that we have no excuse for not going. I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you something that you may be surprised, but probably not. The Americans make 1.1 billion trips per day. And we travel over 11 billion miles per day. <laughs> We're on the go. I don't know about you, Bob. Our car mileage is going higher and higher all the time. We're, we're going, going, going. We have no excuse, do we? And we're, we're people on the go. And God has commanded us to go. Jesus in Matthew chapter 28 said, Go ye therefore into all the world. But I'm afraid today we as churches think, Well, that means that, you know, when that mission trip comes up uh, once a year, then this. That's what he's talking about. We were going to go and, and tell others about Jesus in another foreign country. Friends, I want to tell you what Jesus is telling us. He says, as you go, make disciples. No matter where you're going in your daily life, to the workplace, to the marketplace, to the schoolhouse, wherever you're going, we are to go and make disciples. But I want to tell you some good news this morning. I think this is good to remind us all this morning that we are to go forth from God because He sent us, but there's good news is that we're not going alone. We go with God. He gives us the power to go. Acts 1.8 tells us. He tells His disciples that it's the same for us. That you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you should be being my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. So we have the power available. I, don't, I think Christians just don't tap into it. We need to understand that it's there. That God goes with us. And God has given us the supernatural resources to do the work that He's called us to do. And I don't know about you, but I'm excited about that. Amen. I'm excited today that witnessing is not dependent, thank God, on my personality. Right. On my position. On my persuasiveness. But it is solely dependent upon the power of the Holy Spirit. So friends, we have no excuse. We go forth from God. We, have, we go with God. And He gives us the power to go. But as we go then, we're to sow. 
And I'm afraid we, we don't do a too good job with that. You see, we've been challenged to sow the seed of the Word of God. In order to sow the seed, one must first what? Receive the seed. Amen? And once the seed can be received by the sower, then the soil has to be prepared so that the seed can be planted. And once the seed is planted, then somebody's got to tend to the garden or point a gardener over it. I mean, if you ever walk plant in the garden, you know what I'm talking about. And this process, this really is a three-step process. One first must bear the seed. Now hear me, church. Hear me this morning. That we sometimes assume that somebody else is bearing the seed. I've been in the ministry quite a few years. And I've had people say, well, isn't that the preacher's job? <laughs> it's not his brother Paul. But not the preacher's job just to be the only one to bear the seed. We are all responsible, friends, to bear the seed. And if we're not bearing the seed, friends, I'm going to ask you this morning, you need to do a self-evaluation to understand why you're not. So this second one must break up the soil. You know, sometimes when you're planting a garden, it's, it's sometimes you've got some hard ground you've got to break up. I'm going to tell you, those farmers and those gardeners, when they really want to put seed in the ground see something grow, they dig and dig and plow and, and they turn up the ground, that hard ground, they don't give up. Friends, I want to tell you, church, don't give up. We're living in a society and a world today, church, that, that there's some hard ground. And we have to break the ground sometimes. But we're not to give up. We need to realize that we keep on doing what God's called us to do. We break that ground. And, and once we finally got it broke up, then we plant the seed. We broadcast the seed. And friends, we broadcast it everywhere we go. Just like I said, we, wherever we go, we're broadcasting everywhere. So we are to sow the seed. But then we need to weep. When's the last time, church, that we wept over lost souls? I pray God would give me the tears for lost people. Weeping has to do with the brokenness of one's heart for the lost world. It carries with it the idea of prayerfully agonizing over the state of the lost in our world. But friends, I want to tell you, in order for us to weep, we must first have a deep-seated passion for the Lord Jesus Christ. I think too many churches have lost their passion for Jesus. But I guarantee you, friends, whenever we have that passion for Christ and it's restored again, from that passion for Christ will come a deep compassion for the lost. And it will challenge us. It will compel us as children of God to be active laborers in the harvest field. And then, of course, this is this task, and it's a task, it's a great task, but it's not seen in three areas. First, we need to pray for the lost. Again, when was the last time you prayed for somebody who was lost? And I grew up in church. I'm thankful today that my mother and dad brought me up in church. My mother played the church piano for many years. My dad was a Southern Baptist deacon. My grandfather was a Southern Baptist preacher. And I'm grateful today that I was raised up in, in, in church today. But I can tell you this morning that we, we do a lot of praying in our churches for people who are sick. I've been to a lot of churches. A lot of prayer meetings consist of, well, my Aunt Susie broke her toe. Let's pray for her. Now, I'm not diminishing praying for each other. Hear me. Don't get me wrong. I'm glad when people pray for me. I had surgery several years ago. I had people praying for me. I know what it's like when people praying for you. But here's the point I want to make, church. We, we need to pray for each other, certainly. And many people we're praying for are being believers in Christ, and many of them are ill. And sometimes God doesn't choose to heal people here on this earth. He takes them home, and then they're restored and healed. And friends, and that's the good news about being a Christian. If for some reason your body has a disease, but God doesn't choose to heal you, well, you got good news. You're going to heaven. <laughs> but there are a lot of people who are lost and they're sin sick. And if they die, they're going to a place called hell where they'll have pain forever. Friends, we have 
got to do more than just pray for each other. We've got to pray for the lost. I guarantee you there's probably 70% of this community that's unchurched and lost. And we need to pray for them by name. But we also need to pray for the laborers. <laughs> so many times we say, well, it's somebody else do it. friend, it's not an option. He's called every one of us right. to be laborers in the field. The Bible said, again, they're the field of light in the harvest. And yet the statistics show in most churches, that 20% of the people do 80% of the work. Friends, if you're not serving, you need to serve. You need to plug in. You need to be an active laborer in the field. You see, He's called us all. We can't just sit on the sidelines. And if you're sitting on the sidelines, I pray that God will, will get a hold of your heart and understand this morning that you are responsible, just like everybody else, to go and work the field and to let people know about the good news of Jesus Christ. But a lot of people don't go. And I would ask you today to consider this morning that you go, but you pray for courage. Pray for boldness. I can tell you, we could probably spend several minutes today just reading different parts of the Scripture where it talks about how there were men in the Bible who were bold about sharing their faith. And I can think of Paul. Not the, you know, Paul, I know you have a good name to say. Paul. But man, I'll tell you what, that man, he was a bold witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Boy, if I could be like Paul. But he had boldness. Why, did he, why was he so bold? Because he knew who called him. He knew what it was like to be lost. And he wanted to make sure that everybody knew about Jesus. And he was, he was bold. And I want to tell you, think back on the day you were saved. Think about what God saved you from. I'm going to tell you, most of us probably can think back on that time and think, man, am I grateful to God today because God saved me from sin and He freed me from sin. And, and friend, I want to tell you, if you know what you're saved from and you know what you're going to go, we're going to be going to, we need to be telling everybody we ought to be bold and courageous to go and tell others about Jesus Christ. Yet, as I said earlier, the statistics don't reveal a very good number in Christians sharing their faith. I want to encourage you, church, to share your faith. We must go, we must sow, we must weep, we must pray for the lost, we must pray for labor, we need to pray for courage, but then lastly, I want to tell you this morning as we go, as we sow, as we weep, oh, friends, I got some good news. God promises that we will find that the harvest is plentiful and we will reap along the way. We will reap where we have not sown because others have sown there. Others will come behind us where we have sown. And, friends, God will send the harvest. And as we reap, as we as we reap the harvest, we must realize three things. First of all, because I think this is important, we understand, church, that as we reap, it is God's produce, not ours. We can't take the credit for any. That's His harvest. We're just being obedient as children of God to sow the seed and to plant. But secondly, it's God's plan, not ours. We have to remember that. It's His plan. And His plan is to choose us. There's no plan B. A lot of people think, well, there's probably got to be another place. Friends, there's no other plan. It's God's plan for us to go and to sow and wheat and reap at the harvest. It's His plan. God, I pray for being a part of that plan. Amen? I'm excited that I can be a part of that plan. But it's God's promise and not ours. He promised us that if you'll just do what I've called you to do, <laughs> I'll be faithful. And there will be a harvest. I'm going to tell you, church, so I'm looking for that great day when the harvest is going to brought in. 
And there's going to be a day when we're going to gather together as the church of the living God. And we're going to be able to praise Him around the throne of heaven from all tongues and all tribes, all nations of the world. We're going to be there together. And I am so much looking forward to that day. And if you're not looking forward to it, you better do a check to see why you're not. Because I'm not excited. But church, if I can encourage you to be the church, you may be out here another 144 years. Well, some of you may not be football. But this church may be in existence for a lot longer than we think. We don't know when God going to send his son Jesus to come get us. But I can tell you what, there are, there's a lot of work to be done. And I'm going to close with this statement by Charles Hattiesburg. And hopefully it will encourage you and challenge you today. He says, the most successful servants of God have been those who are not built upon the foundation of others, but have ventured to break up new soil. Whenever we have broken up fresh ground, Whenever we have gone someplace not usually occupied for worship, when we have got a new place of unbroken prairie, what wonderful results have always followed. Even Egypt, break the ground for the kingdom of God. Understand God has called us, and every day is a, a great day that we have a great opportunity to go and tell others about Jesus. Wouldn't it be great, Brother Paul, next year when you have a homecoming and you have to break new ground because you don't have enough room to contain everybody? It can happen. It can happen in all of our churches. There's not enough room right now if we did reach even 50% of our community to hold everybody. Friends, Let's do what God's called us to do. Until He calls us home, let's be salt. Let's be light. Let's let the world know that there's a God who loves them. And my friends, I just can't tell you enough, that God has saved me. And you know what Christ has done for you. There should be no excuse why we shouldn't go and tell somebody what Christ has done in our lives. That's right. I encourage you to speak. Be the church. God has called us to be. Father, I just thank you for this time we've had this morning. I thank you for having me to be the pastor church. I thank you for those who are faithful. I thank you for those who are diligent and claiming your word and being salt light. But God, we do have to come to a time. We have to ask ourselves the question Are we really being salt light? Perhaps there may be those sitting in this building this morning who, who know that you've been speaking to them and they know beyond a shadow of a doubt they're not being salt, they're not being light, they're not serving you, they're not working the field of faith, they're not in the part field trying to plant the seed. And Father, just do what you call them to do. Father, they, they, they know they have no excuse. But God, I pray that you wrap your arms around them this morning and help them to know that you love them. And Father, you desire for them today to come and make a commitment to be an active laborer in the harvest field. But God, we, we know that this morning we're not able to go sow the seed and plant the seed. We can't tell others about Jesus if we don't know Jesus. And I would pray this morning, Father God, that, that there's one person in this building who does not know you in a personal way. They've never given their heart and life to you. And they know that. They know that they were to die today. They would spend eternity in hell. God, I pray right now, Father, you would prick their heart and help them to understand that they need to come today. As Miss Terry has already given the challenge earlier in our song service, that, that they would give their life to Jesus. And Father, that would be a great celebration time for us to be able to celebrate as the angels will celebrate when they give their heart and life to you. Lord, I, I know that you've been speaking. Father, I pray now that you would just help us in this time of invitation. Father, that you would 
Help us to know what it is that we need to do. God, that we'll be obedient. That we'll step out and make that decision. Father, perhaps there are those who need to come deal with these altars to pray for the loss of this community. And maybe pray just to know who they are. They'll pray for them by name. Our God, I continue to give this church a vision and passion for those who are lost. Our God, work in this time of invitation. And may you be glorified in Jesus' name.